This event will focus on the ways in which technology is revolutionizing the teaching of traditional subjects in international school settings. Our panelists will explore the benefits, challenges, and future implications of incorporating ever more advanced technologies into the classroom, including focusing on some of the practical and actionable strategies each guest has used in their own educational settings. We'll also touch on regional inequities um, with technology integration around the world uh, and the importance of having buy-in uh, from leadership teams to effectively implement new technologies in whole school settings. Um, yeah, so I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by, by our guest today. Um, and Sean is our, our guest host, um, founding partner of ISN uh, at Immersed Education. Um, so it'd be great. Maybe if we could do some introductions, quick, quick 10, 50 second introduction, uh, starting with yeah, Kyriakos, do you want to introduce your background and, and, and where you're from? Sure. Thank you so much for the invitation and for having me here today. Um, uh, my name is Kiriakos. I'm the technology director in the United Lisbon International School, a recent school here in the Lisbon area in Portugal. Um, my background is music education and psychology. Um, so I started as a teacher in kindergarten and primary uh, subjects and um, grades. Uh, I had the tendency to, let's say, um, uh, further away from the commercial way of teaching and try to include technology uh, into it in a more interactive way so I can keep my students uh, interested on it. Um, here's my teaching. So I've been teaching for about 15 years now. Uh, my role has really um, um, progressed, developed into a technology integration Working role um, in various schools in various previous projects to the point where right now I am um, um, coordinating the computing curriculum at my current school, it's taking care of our online resources and systems, making sure everyone's on the same page when it comes to the tools, um, our policies, our um, our accesses, of course, anything that that just professional development when it comes to the teaching and learning process. Great. Thanks, Kira um, Claire. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, again, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's great to be able to uh, talk about such an important um, change that's coming in um, to teaching and learning within schools and educational settings. Um, so, yeah, my name's Claire. I'm working as a physics teacher at the moment um, in international schools in the Middle East. Um, held a number of roles um, teaching physics, leading physics. Um, teaching computer science and also um, roles across schools looking at teaching and learning um, and how to get the best out of um, the school and the resources that you have. Um, obviously, the focus now has very much shifted to digital technology, um, and that's an area that I am fully immersed in to try to develop um, for the best for our students and those working in education. Thanks, Claire. And Sean? Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, Claire Kariakos, it's a pleasure to speak with you both today. I'm Sean, the founder of Immerse Education, and as Max mentioned, we're a founding partner of ISN. We're also a leading provider of online and offline educational experiences that prepare high school students for the future. So whether that be the university or the world of work, um, we're focused not only on knowledge transfer, but how do we teach skills and influence mindsets in a way that improves student outcomes? Fantastic. Thanks. Great to have you guys all on this call today. Great. Now I'm delighted to, yeah, hand over the reins to, to Sean, who's going to kick off with the first question. Um, yeah. Hope you guys have a great conversation. So my first question is, broadly speaking, over the last few years, how has technology impacted the teaching of traditional subjects and influenced teaching more widely? I'll hand it over to Kyriakos, Claire, whoever has the... Okay, um, I'll start. Um, so as you know, I'm a physics teacher um, and I feel that um, technology has really allowed uh, myself and my students to really push the boundaries of the subject. Um, before technology was a large part of, of teaching, you were defined by what could be done within the classroom, what resources you had, um, which may be limited by the educational setting you're in, um, and the opportunities that come with that. Um, however, with technology, we can push the physical boundaries. We can um, explore what would happen if um, we didn't have gravity, if force were removed, if we had certain equipment, the 
school could never afford if we had certain weather or external conditions that we can't achieve in the classroom. And so I feel like technology has been really helpful to really explore the subject in depth and to challenge misconceptions. Now that's fascinating. And I think uh, we've seen the rise of technologies such as AR or VR, um, which are changing the way some subjects are taught, the ability to have virtual classrooms with virtual equipment that might be out of reach in terms of resources or you know, geographical limitations. Um, so that's super interesting. Yeah, and I think also through online simulations that are present for a lot of the sciences, especially in physics, um, it means that students are able to complete practical work almost 24-7. They're not, um, you know, stuck by what can be done within the school day. They can preview, preview um, the experiment, they can follow up the experiment, they can take it that, that much further. Um, so I do really feel that it's, it's actually expanding the role of um, technology in traditional classrooms through this is actually expanding the understanding of students and their interest and engagement in the subject. Absolutely. I think one of the main things that we recognize at MERS is that every student's learning journey is different. And so technology also offers an opportunity to personalize um, a student's journey. There are with uh, adaptive learning technologies, for example, um, there's ability for software to actually adapt to a particular student's learning pace and provide real-time feedback as well. Mm -hmm. Is that something that either of yourselves are actively using in your school settings? Um, definitely, if I if I may kind of like um, intervene here and and add my. Uh, my two cents. Um, I completely agree to what was, was said before. I mean, I come from a music background and I taught music and then I've transitioned into more ICT teaching as well. So um, these are all subjects that uh, you, you want to make sure you, you don't just keep try to keep the students engaged um, and participative uh, and, and motivated, but you also want to make sure you're providing them with uh, direct and, 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 and meaningful feedback, uh, which is real time. And that can be done with tools and technologies we have in place, um, it can take various forms. They can take uh, this continuous assessment through these technology uh, tools like online quizzes or uh, managing a digital portfolio or um, the grading systems, the automated grading systems that we can have in place really do help us um, follow up on each, each child's development and uh, providing that direct um, assessment that, that direct feedback to individual students based on their level of expertise and their and their and their and their level. Um, communicate that to the parents, communicate that to the rest of the community, and keeping teachers connected in a way that uh, interdisciplinary learning um, can 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 flourish. So um, not only the tools in itself that allow us to consume content or create, but also to manage, let's say, all this data and information that can be generated uh, through an individual student or in the case of a whole classroom. That's a great point. And obviously during the pandemic, that was one of the biggest um, changes, I think, education experience, and it certainly accelerated the adoption of some learning technologies. But how have you, you know, linked to this question, you know, how has um, the technology that you, you implemented during the pandemic um, actually impacted uh, students uh, today or how's it how's that created a lasting impact now that we've returned to in-person teaching in many settings across the world I, th I think that um, students gained that confidence to take charge of their learning during COVID they had to sign up to platforms where they were working through different modules or nuggets or sections um, and they were actually able to see how they fed together. I think traditionally the teacher was the holder of the knowledge. We knew what we were studying that lesson. We knew what was coming up and the students weren't always aware of that bigger picture. They would just know what the topic was for the, for the day, maybe the week. Whereas um, being able to use these online platforms meant that the whole course was mapped out for them and they don't necessarily have to approach it in a completely linear way. And I think that has continued past um, the, the COVID times because I think the students now, um, from my own perspective, have a much wider awareness of what um, is being covered in their curriculum 
um, and also therefore they can take more ownership because they know what's coming up and the teacher can talk about the subject more holistically instead of this is this lesson you don't need to worry about what's coming next true true and and in order just to add on what claire just said um um the if, if there's one thing the pandemic uh, obliged us to do is to go 10 years in the future and bring back those technologies and the tools <laughs> that we were, we, we were thinking of bringing in to the present um and it it it, it made us it made classrooms um uh, expand and, and and go outside their own walls so obviously we had to put collaboration and communication on the top of the skills that we are building and promoting um online platforms came into place discussion forums became a very specific uh, a, a tool of engagement uh, obviously, the video conferencing tools and all that um, had teachers and administration and parents themselves understand that, well, learning can take so many different, uh, can be done in so many different uh, ways. Um, and it, it, does, it does come to the individual experience that you want to, 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 to teach the, the student to be part of, um, which, which uh, connects directly with what happens in this virtual environment. Um, and this, let's say, the COVID brought a lot of a uh, uh, mindset, and be a lot of a uh, change in mindset, a lot of change in attitude and in posture, especially from the part of the teachers, understanding that um, some tools can be used, obviously, to facilitate the online learning. But coming back to the classroom, um, they can be used to enhance those experiences that they had in place because they had to during the pandemic. Yeah, I think it's important to build on the parents having that awareness as well. I think during COVID, the parents had a window into what the students were doing. Um, previously, I've noticed that when students hit, you know, tech, a secondary school, they're teenagers, maybe they don't talk about what's happening at school in as much detail. Um, but when everyone was kind of locked at home together and the learning continued, parents had that window into what their students were doing. And I think it's actually made the bond between the parents and the school and between the parents and their own student, their own children, our students, be that a little bit stronger because they're now aware of what they're learning and how they're learning. Um, and I think that has actually helped um, for collaboration and for better communication and better relationship building within an educational setting. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think the, the the fact that students are taking perhaps greater ownership of their own learning journey um, because they were forced to um, during the pandemic. And that's now led also to better communication and better transparency and better relationship building between all stakeholders of the students' educations. Fascinating. And I think that leads us on to our next question, which is how can technology be used to enhance student engagement and outcomes? Okay, so I'll start with what has probably been the most successful um, way I've managed to increase engagement um, across every single age group and across multiple subjects, um, which is games. Um, as we know, students love games. I love games. Uh, lots of people love games. Uh, when you get immersed in a game, you often forget the time. Um, you enter into a state of flow. Um, you're you know, interested in achieving um, the goal, the mission, the adventure that's before you. Um, by using game-based learning and gamification, um, everything from gim kits and cahoots to class craft, I've been able to support students to feel that in some ways they're no longer learning, even though they are, um, but to be fully engaged in that experience th through the use of a game or game-like elements. Um, and that, in my opinion, would not be possible to the extent that it is without technology. Claire, I'm so happy you you kind of brought that as the first topic because um, I have a feeling this this question we focus on, on game based learning and gamification um, because I'm I'm a big I'm a big uh, supporter of this uh, let's say teaching method because for the past let's say for the past five or six years um, I've been um, very much working with uh, Minecraft as an educational tool in the classroom. Uh, you mentioned some great tools that uh, gamify the environment and help students and built on leaderboards and badges and built on that um, uh, immediate feedback that video games are so uh, well uh, um, well famous for. Um, and with Minecraft, 
um, being such a um, flexible and such a um, um, uh, such a um, very immersive platform, um, we, we, we I was able to see how not only it can um, bring the best out of the students when they become immersed in an activity that involves a topic on a, on a subject they're studying and its flexibility can be can can, can it's, it's it's easy to be seen across all subjects, but it also allowed teachers um, to take a step back um, and 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 allow that learning to take place because. Um, Besides the obvious advantages, let's say, of, of, of games as educational tools, um, I was with Minecraft in the classroom, I was able to see that, and I still see it, that um, the, the students, or most of the students, they dominate the platform. They don't need to know how the tool works. Um, you, the teacher needs to um, not catch up, I would say, but come down to the level of the student and understand that I can be mentored on a tool that they really um know their way around uh, and i can act as a mentor as a as a, i can act as a facilitator i can act as a um as, as someone who helps students identify when the learning takes place and it's been amazing to see what uh, uh, students and, and teachers were able to do with these kind of approaches yeah i, re I really agree with that i've also used a little bit of minecraft and, and just seen the immersivity of it um, and I also think that sometimes in the classroom, traditionally, we may have tried to force collaboration, you know, trying to get the kids to get into groups without any knowledge of what they're getting into groups for, what the task is going to be. Um, whereas I do think that you get a lot more organic collaboration within a game environment because the students immediately know what it is that they need to do to be successful and they know who they need on their team or they know who they need to go to for support. Um, and I also do think that so much of education now needs to move past just the teaching of facts. Um, we will be able to obtain facts um, through technology uh, whenever and wherever we need to. I do not remember everything I learned at school. I just, you know, go into a search engine and, and find it as and when I need it. But through games, students are developing transferable skills and they might not even realize it, you know, such as analytical thinking, having to think quickly with large amounts of information coming in, um, being able to problem solve, being able to work collaboratively as a team, being able to take leadership roles. All of this has been, you know, portrayed within games and the students might not even realize it um, and I think it's absolutely fantastic to engage the students firstly by getting them playing games but then as you said Hirakus about mentoring them and um, supporting them to realize that they're developing so much more um, and they've got them themselves the students themselves have got a lot to teach each other including the the teacher and, it, and then it makes it a learning environment as opposed to having a power balance and I think that's what technology's done it stopped there being this power our balance with the teacher knows everything and the students are there to to kind of become more like the teacher and I think when you make a, a nice fully immersive learning environment where everybody's learning from each other I think you get a lot more buy-in from the students yeah thank you both those were fascinating examples of how um, technology particularly uh, the use of games in the classroom setting um, are really helping to improve the way students are learning um, related to that, how do you think schools can create an environment where that technology is readily um, adapt, uh, adopted um, by teachers or, or by, by schools in general? Um, uh, if I may, I think the first, the first most crucial uh, point here is um, obviously democratize the access to these tools and the, uh, and, and the technologies in place. Um, so that uh, any teacher can feel uh, free and can feel free and comfortable to um, to select and and try and try to bring something new, something different uh, in their classroom. Um, and obviously, training and professional development is by far one of the most important aspects that a school needs to maintain. A school community needs, needs to um, push forward so that um, the training, the, 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 the exploring skills and training teachers properly into into a tool that you want to bring in um, comes in, 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 into place. Um, that obviously uh, on, its, on its own is not enough. I believe the school not only needs to have technology as a as the main uh, as the main pillar, let's say, in, in their in their in their culture but also very much promote 
both successes and failures that tools of this kind can, can generate, can create in a classroom and communicate that out, connect with the, with the rest of the school community, with other schools, uh, uh, harness the power of amplify their messages through social media, media um, just to show how um, much engagement and interaction and, and, and real tangible results um, take place once a proper tool comes into the equation. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I, I also think that the, the the management and leadership team of a school needs to fully trust the teacher to know that we are not replacing learning by playing a game. We are using the game as a tool in order to increase engagement and delve into skills that may be better discovered and developed within a game setting. And I think having that trust from the, the managing team and also support with parents, because we all know that if a student goes home and said, I didn't learn anything today, I was just playing games, um, that's not gonna sound so good. And so we do need a whole school culture and approach to say, no, these are educational games. These are tools that we use. And, and these are the skills that we are, we are getting the students to develop. Um, and so you do have to get the buy-in of the whole culture because um, in the past, games have been seen as not adding value and in some ways being like either a reward that you get at the end after hard work or, um, you know, a deviation from doing hard work. And I think now technology has improved in such a way that some of the hardest work can be achieved by trying to play a game or be immersed in a game like environment in order to 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 reach the, the skill that's that's trying to be achieved. I think that's a yeah, that's a fantastic point. Um, I think we need to get buy in from all stakeholders. And I think it's about education as well around how technology can be used in, in educational settings and shifting a mindset as well. Um, what is the importance of having an open and progressive IT policy at school? And how can reg regionality hold back the integration of technology within the school, creating possible inequities in education around the world? Um, if I may start with this one, I think we need an open and progressive IT policy because we need to emulate what is actually happening in the world of technology. If we write a policy that is going to be reviewed in three or four years, as some policies traditionally have been, they're up for renewal every two to four years, then how are we going to make sure that we're keeping abreast of new developments? And so we need something that is quite fluid, um, is progressive, that it's reaching forward into what's coming, not what is here now, so that everybody involved in the learning process can feel empowered to take risks. New technologies don't always take off and they don't always work and they don't always work in the ways we thought they would. But by having an IT policy that encourages risk um, and it's progressive, it will allow teachers and educators to try new things. And, and that's, how, that's how innovation works. And in some ways, that's how we want our students to learn. And if they don't have the role models of us, seeing us trying new things and having progressive policies for their environment, then how are they going to be able to, to have um, progressive ideas themselves? And so I, I do think it's about having something that works, not just for now, but for the future, but also being a role model to the students to say, hey, we don't know all the ideas. We don't know what's going to work, but we're actually in this together. And we have a fluid policy like you you have to have a fluid kind of growth mindset and developing that at school is going to propel you into the workplace and further education way more than anything else. Exactly. Thank, thank you for that, Claire. Um, and uh, we've touched a bit on this before um, regarding the topic of equity and access to education uh, from a teacher's point of view and the professional development point of view, but this also applies to students in classrooms. Once we, um, an open IT policy you know, has to ensure that the, all the students, um, uh, not just in, let's say, in, an, in, the, in, in our own educational micro universe, but uh, thinking abroad into the, into, the, into, the, into the region we represent, um, the country and beyond, they have equal access to the opportunities, they have equal access to the technology resources uh, and the tools. So um, 
taking into consideration a school like my own, let's say, which we have the, the privilege of um, the luxury of having access to the tools, um, we need to make sure we guarantee that uh, we, we, we support the, the extended community and beyond um, as is our role in education. And um, that also touches a bit upon the, the skills we want to develop. So an open, an open IT policy, let's say, will focus on the development of uh, skills that um, uh, allow, allow that, those, those policies and those, and, those, and those guidelines to flourish. Digital literacy, for example, um, um, let's say um, digital citizenship, um, the critical thinking, the collaboration that always, let's say, connects directly to how technology is accessed, consumed, and shared, and, and interacted with. So, um, and just to conclude that this 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 thought, um, a major part of any educational institution's um, uh, strategy is definitely infrastructure and connectivity. So we cannot we cannot assume we have access to all these tools and resources and sharing and collaboration without the basic in place. The access uh, to to the technology does. Uh, depend on the infrastructure to break down barriers to education rather than to to build them and so um, I think addressing those regional barriers such as the you know, poor internet access or has lack of resources for purchasing of of um, tech equipment should probably be the baseline scenario uh, should be should, we should be trying to create a, a more democratic and equitable um, baseline for all members of society to be able to benefit yeah i also think you know we have a lot of policies within educational settings that have an element of looking beyond the school community as part of them you know where like you said before like literacy policies looking at how you can drive literacy within the community you know it's always about our outreach um, and seeing what the school can do because that also allows students to develop those skills um, that they're going to need, um, as well as, let's be honest, ticking some boxes if students are doing awards like citizenship awards or, you know, Duke of Edinburgh, etc. There's always opportunities for students to get out in their community, banking CAS hours, you know, or, or whatever. Um, and I do think that a progressive IT policy would also have those same opportunities of how are our you know, students going to be able to, you know, integrate with the rest of their um, local, then regional, then national, then international community in terms of IT? Um, and what could they do? Whether that is, you know, holding classes for the elderly, uh, whether that is, you know, um, helping young people to get into technology or understanding the dangers of it, you know, or whether that's just having a link with a school in a, in a country that maybe doesn't have those same opportunities and working with them on some cloud-based projects um, so that those students get access to, to maybe a piece of software that they can't access, but a school can host. Um, and other students can tap into. So I do think, um, you know, an IT policy should be looking beyond the, the one school or group of schools and start to think about the global connectivity and what they're going to put back into that. Thank you. And what are some potential ethical considerations or challenges um, that surround the use of technology in education, um, well, this is this is this is a big one, obviously, um, and it can take various aspects. Let's say um, I think I would start by going into the uh, one of the hardest ones to to grasp and and control and 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 and, and try to to have in place as we should, which is data privacy and responsible data handling. Um, schools themselves generate a lot of data. Schools partner with external partners to generate even more data. These external partners have one thing in their mind is to be able to, besides obviously the, the ethical providing a good service, but how to make even, how to make more money and reach more students and more schools through their services, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a market thing and, and it's, and it serves its purpose. Um, but, um, 
in an ethical point of view, we all schools need to make sure that it's crucial to have and establish strict protocols and safeguards to protect the data of the students, protect the data that are generated through all these systems, either is demographic data, uh, attendance data, grading data, um, uh, all, 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 all these nuances and, and details that we can get to by applying all these tools. And in order for that to be uh, properly, um, let's say, uh, adopted by the community itself, it needs to be transparent. It needs to be transparent as it's communicated to the parents, to the stakeholders, um, how the data is collected, how it is stored, um, what purpose does it serve? So these policies need to be in place even before we start bringing any type of tool that needs that data um, to pro properly function. I think I think that's really important. Um, the points you've raised about um, data privacy, um, and I think building on from that is the students don't even aren't even aware of what data of theirs is being taken. They're just clicking to sign in with one single sign password, single sign on, single sign on, um, and so the actual additional point I think we need to be aware of is since COVID, a lot of students ended up having to use their own devices and those devices were quite wide ranging, anything from smartphones to tablets to computers. And I think those schools that operate a bring your own device um, or fall into a bring your own device as computers have been purchased or devices have been purchased recently and you know parents might not be able to buy into a school-wide system. We just need to be very aware of what the students are clicking. What are they allowing their data to be sent, their images to be sent, um, information about them? Because when students have a bring your own device, um, who's responsible for filtering that? It, traditionally, the teacher was the filter. Whatever happened in your classroom was filtered through you. Certain topics could be avoided. You could make sure they were discussed appropriately. Um, you knew what was being displayed and handed out and what students were removing from that lesson and that experience of learning. Whereas now we have, you know, 20 to 30 students potentially all on their own devices with you know, different software for checking viruses or not, with different websites open, with different adverts. Uh, they may be borrowing computers from other people in their families and therefore those adverts may be tailored more towards them. And they are just accepting. They're not reading terms and conditions. They're just clicking and accepting, clicking and accepting. And I think that that's a really important challenge is when you do have students in your care um, on devices that you are not in control of, um, there's been that awareness of how are you policing that, how are you managing that, and how are you supporting to ensure the content that is being used, observed, and passed around is appropriate to the setting and to the age group, and also culturally, because some countries will not allow certain images or conversations to be had, but if they have software that allows their device to be in another location, then they're suddenly able to access that, um, which is something I found firsthand in China. Um, a lot of students have software to make their computer believe that it's in the States or it's, it's in Europe, and therefore they're able to access, you know, social and, um, and even historic information that would normally be banned. Um, and I think these are challenges and considerations for the use of technology in classrooms. Absolutely. I think those were you know, fascinating viewpoints and just goes to show that the concern for data privacy goes hand in hand with safeguarding concerns of you know, many different um, in, uh, many different uh, scopes um, for, for a student. Um, I'd like to move on to um, a hotly debated uh, topic within this um, area of ethical considerations, which is that of screen time um, mm -hmm. for students. And technology obviously plays a role in increasing the amount of screen time that students might have. And this could have physical or psychological impacts on students. Um, what have What's your viewpoint on it? And do you have any examples um, of, of, of how screen time have impacted your yeah. students? Um, I, th I think the screen time is a hotly debated topic, and I think it should be. Um, but I think one thing that we need to be aware of, and this is my opinion, is that 
student use of screen time um, isn't just within schools. Um, and that's where a partnership needs to come in between everybody involved in that child's life. For example, if a child is using a screen at all times when not at school, then yes, using a lot of screen time at school is not going to be um, it's not going to be great for that student because you then pretty much have every waking minute they are on a screen. However, if that child goes home and is encouraged to go out and do sport and go for a walk, walk the dog, you know, spend time doing other activities outside school, and therefore the only time they're on a screen is, is at school, then that's a very different scenario. Um, and I think that's why the discussion about screen time needs to bring the caregivers, those parents involved, um, so that we're looking at not just how much in terms of hours students are on screens, but also what they're using it for. Um, if we agree an amount of time that is appropriate, how much of that is for educational purposes and how much of that may be just sat on an iPad when they've gone out to dinner, you know, or sitting for an hour, you know, on a commute to and from school, just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, and so I think that's pretty important. And then building on from that is then as a school, we have to look at a an overview of what does that average student days look like? If every single teacher is using the device for a full hour lesson every single period, then yes, that's a lot of screen time. Um, however, if we can get an overview of how that student is using computers, for example, it's a tool, one student is using their laptop out of four within a collaborative project. That's very different than them just staring at the screen for the whole hour. So I do think it's a bigger question. We have to get everybody, the child's at the center of that. And then the conversation is everybody, every adult um, around that child needs to be involved in the discussion of how long and what is being done whilst on the screen. I couldn't agree more. Claire, I'm just going to build up and on that topic, on, on what uh, you were just saying. Um, obviously, obviously, balancing screen time is extremely important. Uh, we all know research shows, we've seen it as teachers, as parents. Um, excessive screen time can have effects on, on, on students, both physical and mental health. Um, so... Uh, Striking, striking that balance between the, the use of technology and other activities that can eventually promote a, 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 a well-run development um, is the responsibility of, in, of, of schools that filters down to the teacher who connects directly with caregivers and tries to provide the best possible environment for students to learn and flourish. Um, now, there's one thing I would like to not debate, but... Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of um, conversation regarding screen time. And obviously it's normal. It's normal that usually the conversation regarding screen time only focuses on um, how much part of the, of, the, of, of the question, right? And how much screen time is, is good? And how, how, when should we limit it? And essential parts of this topic should involve factors like what, is being used uh, for the, uh, through the screen when it's being used. Very good example of Claire saying, well, there's one thing that's being done in schools, but what happens when students are on their free leisure time, um, unsupervised, let's say. And then obviously the why. We cannot um, take the merit out of the fact that students, children these days, socialize very, very much through their, their personal devices, through the screens. That's how they consume that content. Um, but we as teachers, as educators, as parents, as caregivers, we need to be as much as part of it as possible, not in the way of, 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 uh, incent uh, of, of promoting even more screen time, but um, be being part of the, the, the content and the way it's being consumed. We can't just assume screens are, you know, nannies or, or they're going to they're gonna take away uh, some of the responsibility that we should have. Um, we need to be constantly alert and we need to be part of that uh, learning and social development process of students that use devices for teaching, that use devices for social exploration or simply for consuming content. And um, there's a lot of stakeholders that have to be involved at all times. That goes that's beyond any doubt. Absolutely. And I think 
it's as you both said, it's about looking at screen time, not in binary terms, good or bad, but looking at it qualitatively and not just quantitatively. Like it's not just a matter of how many hours you're spending a week looking at a screen, but also what are those hours spent doing? Um, and that's a, you know, it's, it's going to continue to be a hot topic of debate, but um, some very interesting viewpoints uh, that we've uncovered. And what do you see the future role of technology playing in the teaching of traditional subjects? Um, how might the recent surge of artificial intelligence in educational settings be a positive tool? Um, I'll, I'll start, but um, then I'll let you continue and add a little bit more onto this, I'm sure. But I think I think the role of technology is to make it ever more personalized. And I think in some ways that has always been the 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 pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for a teacher. Every every teacher has always wanted to to make that lesson, that that learning experience be crafted in such a way that it speaks to each and every child. And and for years we've we've had differentiation and you know and how do we do that and, and what are the techniques to try to include as many learners um, at the forefront of the learning experience, to try to support each and every child with their differing learning needs, to, to support, to scaffold, but also to challenge and to push. Um, and I think that is the perpetual challenge for the teacher is, is how am I ensuring every child matters? I think the role of technology is, as long as we remember it is a tool, not a replacement, is that is going to give the teacher the ability, the skills, the time, the resources to continue to ever more personalize the learning experience, to be able to set students off on tasks, um, to be able to allow technology, including AI-based programs, to, to do some of those basic number crunching, to, to suggest some of those next steps, thus freeing up the teacher to be there carefully guiding and tweaking and manipulating the learning journey for each student. Um, so I do actually, for me, see AI as something that will almost be like a buddy or a personal assistant. For the teacher, it's that personal assistant, something that's going to help you come up with ideas, you know, get a bit of admin done out the way, um, help you to, to connect the dots ever faster than you could before. And I think for the student, it's moving towards that kind of buddy, that kind of coach, that kind of one-to-one -one where the student will have somebody to be like, well, what does that mean? Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, can you give me some examples? Well, can you suggest this? It's literally like a person, I guess, almost there to bounce ideas off and to keep guiding them forward. And so rem remembering it is a tool, not a replacement, I think it is going to ever more personalize um, and drive that individual experience for students and teachers. Thank you, Claire. I mean, of course, the elephant in the room here is AI, is um, ChatGPT, and uh, we've seen that uh, practical being uh, in, in practical terms, the personalization taking place. Um, I'm sit, sitting down with my teachers here in my school and asking uh, ChatGPT, well, you know, can you please prepare a lesson plan with that topic? And for this grade of students, excellent. Now, can you personalize that for students that are, you know, high, medium, or low, or change that because of a learning uh, disability or, or, or an extra support you want? So we, we've seen those results coming immediate uh, and, and saving a lot of time to the teacher. Thus, let, let's say, paving the way to that. Uh, future of personalization and uh, the the other day for example i was looking at the amazing the job that they're doing there over there at, at the um, at Khan academy introducing um i think they, they, they're called canmigo a kind of a ai chatgpt generated uh, let's say uh, a system that does exactly that that you were saying so the student it, the students can communicate with it in a very comfortable um one-to-one -one approach and the AI will have conversations with them, not providing the answers, but giving them back prompts on how they should think and feed back to the system their answer. And I think going back to our conversation about what video games in general games do very well, besides the immediate feedback, they always keep you on the edge of your, uh, of your maximum 
capacity. The, the next challenge is always a little bit further than what you just did. And keeping the students on that level, on that silver lining is um, where the real learning takes place. You don't want to give them all the tools and the answers. You want to make sure that um, they learn by doing, they learn by experience. And the next, let's say, uh, the, the next threshold is just a little bit out of reach and you need to put yourself forward to get there. So AI can eventually do that. We're, we're looking at the very first um, aspects of it, the very first baby steps. Um, and it's definitely um, going to progress as we're looking at it. Um, and that will feed eventually into different ways that we interact with that. So right now there's a lot of typing and reading and back and forth with the AI. Um, once that becomes more interactive and more immersive, we will see it uh, being introduced into virtual reality uh, and augmented reality um, environments where students will be able to interact directly with an AI that represents, let's say, a historical figure or a, a, a musician or any personality of a topic that they're exploring and explore a topic of, the, of their choosing um, always in those limits of their of their challenges. And that is really exciting. <laughs> yeah. And also the one more thing I'd like to add is that I've heard I've heard some people say that the advent of AI is in some ways going to to limit the relationships between teacher and student and in some ways degrade them a little bit. But I actually think it's going to make them better because if the AI is there to get through that basic fact providing, that basic prompting, that immediate feedback and that engagement, that's really going to free the teacher up to help to develop the whole child. And, and you know, that's what every teacher is wanting to do. Yes, they're teaching their little bit of the curriculum and, and they're promoting their little area of of a student's repertoire of subjects. But what a teacher is also trying to do is they're trying to help that child to turn out of their current phase, whether they're primary or secondary or a further education, but trying to come out of that better than they, they went in. Um, and they're also trying to prepare them for the next stage, um, for the world of work, for, for the world of study. And, and teachers know that we need to be supporting students to develop skills and to collaborate and to be more social and to learn practical skills and all these things. But we are often bogged down with administrative tasks and getting through the content. And I think by being able to free up our time a little bit by having these additional tools, um, which AI is going to be for us, then I think it's actually going get to us, get us to know our students ever more deeply because our focus will now be on how are we ensuring they don't lose what it means to work with each other? How are we ensuring they're developing the correct social skills? How are we ensuring that they are prepared for the world of further study or work? And much more of a teacher's role will actually be focused on the supportive skill development, which means fundamentally you're going to get to know each of your kids ever more deeply. And with the feedback you're also going to get from these AI-driven platforms and programs, you're going to know stuff about your students that you may never have known before because before they were one out of 20 or one out of 30, but now they are one out of one. And I think that is what is going to be the future role for technology. Uh, and the future role of the teacher. Absolutely, and it's, it's fascinating. It's also extremely exciting. Um, I know at MERS, we're really focused on learning experiences, so going beyond knowledge transferring, looking more into skills development and, um, and mindset influence. And I think AI solving that um, aspect, as you mentioned, just frees up educators' time so in all settings to be able to influence a, a, a child's uh, development. And you know, recognizing AI as a tool, as a co-pilot or as an assistant, rather than a replacement, I think is kind of quite a crucial um, way to understand how AI will help to supercharge educators rather than replace or, or limit them. So I think that takes us to the end of our discussion today. I'd like to thank uh, Kyriakos, Claire, and also Max from ISN. Um, for, for organizing this session. It's been really, really fascinating. 
Thanks, guys. That was that was exceptional. I, I was absolutely, yeah, just just so so interesting listening to, to all your thoughts and ideas. Um, a couple of takeaways that I got from that, you know, the, the importance of game based learning and, and how that can be used to create super, you know, super engaged students. Um, I, Claire, I like your points around how schools can integrate, must integrate more with their surroundings as well, and help not only maybe their school group, but also, you know, um, the sort of the yeah, helping restabilize equity within certain regions, especially that that um, that maybe don't have access to. To the tools that some you know more wealthy international schools do uh, and how they can spread that spread that knowledge um and also the cultural, cultural sensitivities of sharing content um encouraging positive use of screen time as well i thought was super interesting and then you know like like sean rounded off there um really really perfectly was to you know how, how ai and Bella, you said as well how ai is going to free up educators to to essentially develop the whole the whole child and focus on those human skills and that which which a computer can never 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 really um never really substitute um or for now certainly <laughs> anyway yeah thank thank you so much guys for your time that was absolutely fascinating